for Prima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is former Springbok rugby player Skark Berger Sr., here to discuss his co-authored memoir titled Just a Moment. As a person who dreamt of becoming a designer of Formula One racing cars, how did you end up becoming a rugby player? It's just fate. I think, you know, what happens to you sometimes in life, um, you know, because uh, I was going to leave South Africa in 1974, which many years ago. At that stage, now I was playing a lot of sport, provincial sport in cricket and rugby and so forth. And then, uh, you know, I realized uh, I'm, I'm too big to become a Formula One racing driver. That's what I actually wanted to become. So I started corresponding with Tyrrell and the Formula One teams and how can I become a designer? And the Birmingham School of Design was the place to go. And so eventually um, I got accepted, but they wanted you to work for two years in a racing team before you went and studied. Uh, the practical side of things. And um, what happened then was my brother was a year behind me at school. And he said, uh, maybe I should uh, just go do the army. And then the two of us go overseas together. And that was the first mistake that came about. So I went to the army. And then in September, I had this phone call of Dr. Craven stating... Uh, he would like me to come to Stellenbosch University and play rugby. I said, no, I'm going overseas. I'm going to design cars. So he said, Are you, why would a rugby player like you want to play with cars? And uh, so I thought, and then I had to go back to my brother. And I said, maybe we should first study post school. And then once we've got uh, you know, studies through, we can go further. He said, well, what am I going to do? I, I'm not expecting anything. So I eventually got myself into Stellenbosch to do a B-commerce degree and I got him into a teacher's training college to become a teacher. And uh, then the plans all just changed from there. We never got to go overseas. And tell us how you became the first white Springbok selected from a colored team. That's also a bit of a long story. Uh, in 1981, I wasn't selected uh, you know, I had certain political beliefs in, in my life. And, and, you know, the story, in a way, is also just telling uh, a story of, of a white guy living in a, in a funny world, you know, if I can call it as such, which it was. My background wasn't the traditional Afrikaner background. Uh, you know, I'm Scott Willem Petersburger, and I belong to the Dutch Reformed Church. My dad was an Afrikaner, and he was a bit of a far-right guy. During the Second World War, he belonged to the Osawa Brandwach. My mother was Welsh. She's Roman Catholic and uh, English-speaking. And from the day that she died, I only spoke English to my mother. You know, and she was black, so she was far left. She and her sisters got into trouble, you know, with uh, Molly Blackburn and Helen Sussman. Uh, they, they demonstrated once when the president was being uh, inaugurated in Cape Town and but we grew up in this house where it was open debate and stuff like that, you know, which I think many of my friends didn't. You know, we, we had this sort of like open debate. At university and after that, I was very opposed against the National Party and the Brutalborn. And being young, I was quite vociferous about it. And I just remember the Springbok team at that stage was very much controlled. You know, the Brutalborn was very involved. They tried to get rid of Dr. Craven. So uh, it's very much like certain political parties these days, you know. Everything was, you had to conform. You know, if you didn't conform, then you were sort of like against. And when I got to the Cape, uh, I played for Western Province and I went and played for Eastern Province. And there was a lot of bad blood between Eastern Province and Province at that stage, which many of the people know about. And I came back and one evening at a practice. And remember those days we were in sports isolation. There was hardly any tests being played in South Africa. You know, there were embargoes against us. And this evening at a practice, uh, there was a bit of a fight. And I'd knocked out a few guys and they said to me, okay, you must leave the field. So I said, I'd never want to play for Western Province again in my life. What happened was I walked off the field and I said, well, that's me finished with rugby. And the following morning, a, a wonderful guy, uh, Dougie Dyers, you know, who was with Sarkos and had started the Federation Rugby and everything, he phoned me and he said, 
well, I'd be willing to play for the Western Province League, which was promptly a coloured team. They only had like two to three white players playing. Now, you must know, 84 was uh, difficult times in South Africa, especially, uh, you know, in the Western Cape, uh, the UDF was in control, and, you know, let's call it your non-white areas, there was a lot of riots and stuff going on. And uh, the captain of the league was Pompey's Williams, who uh, worked for me. Can you believe it? And then I said, okay, uh, I will play for you guys. So I started playing for the league. So we went all to these smaller little fields and stuff like that. And then Western Province and Jan Picard, who's the president, phoned me and said, I must please come and play for Western Province. I said, no, I'm not going to. And uh, then I played for the Federation against the Lions. They had a very good game. And the actual the Saturday, when all young white guys would play for Western Province and try and get into the Springbok team. And I remember 84, I was not a Springbok anymore. And we all knew it would be maybe the last time for maybe eight to nine years that somebody could become a Springbok. And uh, I actually played a curtain raiser for Western Province League against Southwestern Districts to the Western Province team who then played against England. And the John Scott team, and that evening, the Springbok team was announced. And obviously, I'd never thought I'd be in the team, and I went out for dinner with some friends. In the meantime, there was this frantic search for me. Where are you? You, you know, because... And eventually, there's a guy who was taking photographs. He used to go from restaurant to restaurant, and he came in, and he said, Oh, yeah, you are. I said, What do you mean, yeah? I said, Congratulations, you're a Springbok. And I said, No, it can't be. And uh, so it came, you know, to this day, I'm the only white guy ever to become a Springbok out of a non-white team. And my book is about that. It's a, it's a funny combination of stuff. You take decisions in life, uh, some wrong, some right, and some you don't understand, but, you, you know, you've got like an idea in your life. And, you know, I always thought what I did in the beginning was the right thing, and that's how it came about. I've never made a big thing of it. Uh, but, you know, I go to the Federation uh, meetings and stuff, and I've got wonderful friends still there, you know. And why did Daniel Checky Watson ask to wash your feet and begin the process of forgiveness between the Watson and the Burgess families? Well, I don't know. I think it, it was political. And, you know, I'm not political. And I can say it now. But with the Watsons, there's always a political undertone. And I'm not so certain how... Um, you know, honest they are about their meaning, you know, their meaning of certain things. It, it happened with Grand Power that came to my first phone me and he said, uh, the dear Lord had appeared in front of him and he's got to see me. And I ended up saying, well, I'll see you. He came and he had a very long prayer and everything. And then he came up and he said, but Chiki wants to wash my feet. So I said, yeah, but why would he want to wash my feet? I've done nothing against him. My son was in the Springbok team and his son was trying to get in the team. And his son had made that statement that he wants to puke on the Springbok rugby jersey. And I remember my son saying he's not going to forgive him because everybody was then asked to forgive Luke. And my son said very clearly, he said, why must I forgive Luke? You know, he, he made the statement against the Springbok team and he said, when you play for the Springboks, you take an oath. Any guy playing for his national team, you take an oath for the traditions and the morality of the team. So he said, Luke should actually uh, ask for forgiveness from me, which, you know, I accepted. And then I realized there's a bit of a political play because uh, Graham Powell was involved with Western Province Rugby and Luke and Skulk were playing together and I think it went about the captaincy. It ended where I said, okay, I'll come to his house. I went to Grandpa's house that Sunday, and then Cheeky arrived. Then he started telling me I'm an Afrikaner and I'm this and that. I said, well, Cheeky, let's just stop it. Just stop it. I know you from 1973. You and Mike Ryan shared a room above me when we played Cravenweek. I know you from Port Elizabeth. I know Dan Valence and Gavin, who's now sadly passed away. I said, what's this all about? Then I said to him, yeah, but you people don't understand black and whatever. I said, Cheeky, what are you talking about? I said, Uncle Dan Klepe, who was at that stage president of Kwaru, the Kwasi Kelly Rugby Union. I said, you don't even know that what guys like me and Juan Rupert did for Uncle Dan. I said, you know that 
that fence around. And I tell the story. You know, the security piece at that stage was after me. Why? Because I uh, employed Norman in Shinga, who had been in Robben Island. And in my book, I tell the story how he came into my room when he was chairman of the Eastern Province Rugby Union. And people today don't understand, because many people even those days understood what was going on, you know, in the realm of white Afrikaner dom trying to dominate and control everything. I was a different thinker about it. And, you know, how crazy it is. I'm captain of Eastern Province Rugby. I'm trying to employ, for the first time ever, there was not a sales guy until 1979 ever employed by South African breweries in the Eastern Cape. Then I got told I'm not allowed to employ this guy. And Norman was a wonderful guy, beautiful guy. And he told me all the stories, and I said, how did you get me into trouble? I eventually employed him. He took me to see Uncle Dan, and Uncle Dan had these wonderful people on his committee. I mean, uh, Silas Nkabunu, who later on became president of SA Rugby, was his treasurer at that stage. Max Pokwana, who's now the CEO of the Tabo and Becky Foundation, was doing his articles uh, for Silas Nkabunu at that stage. So uh, I said to him, listen, th this is my background. So don't you come and tell me if you don't understand me. And then they started praying, him and Grand Power, and it made me very, very uneasy. Eventually he said, well, can you wash my feet? I said to him, no. So he said to me, why? I said, this thing is political, and I'm not a political person. You know, I've got nothing against you, whatever, but I know tomorrow you're going to go to the media and try and say, because remember what happened was, he that's Cheeky Watson, he went to the media and said, there's a third force controlling South African rugby, which is the biggest lot of hogwash. So much so that me and your Rupert uh, named a buffalo bull that he, uh, uh, that he bought, third force. And we were trying to control SA rugby and everything. I mean, it was absolute hogwash. I mean, where? Can anybody show where we were involved? All what we once did is we spoke about people when they tried to fire Jake White prior to 2007. We said, this is a political issue. So just stop it. Let rugby decisions be taken. And just remember, the Watsons have always tried to control stuff from behind, which it's been proven. Go and see what Gavin did and everything. And all the Watsons were involved. So I'm not going to get into political issues. And that's why I decided, no. And that was the decision. And the captaincy was taken away from you by Doc Craven and handed it to Nas Puerta for the Cavalier services. Can you tell us more on this? There were a few things. The one was political of sorts, and why I knew about that was the guy who was general manager of South African rugby, um, Alex Kellerman, was my father-in-law's best mate, you know, from Port Elizabeth. And he said to my father-in-law, please tell Scott to stop with these political issues. Now, it wasn't that there were political issues, just that I despised of the brutal from an early age. And I've been asked this a lot since I wrote it in the book. And I'm at the stage where I'm just saying, that was my opinion about life. I didn't want to be involved with the brutal ball, you know. And there's no ways that I could get involved with the brutal ball, you know, having a mother that's Roman Catholic or English, because then, then you were just bad blood. So what happened was there were two things. The one was that although I captained the last 18 final trial, and you know, Nas Porter wrote in his book also that I was going to be the captain. There was a big piece in the newspaper, a photograph of my son, and became Springbok and his brother, and my wife in the report, is this the next Springbok captain? What had happened was I'd found out that the Cavaliers were coming to tour here when I played for the World 15 in Cardiff in Wales. And to think I could have played for, for Wales because of uh, my mother, you know, and my son could have played for Wales. And I also found out how much they're going to be paid. So I started negotiating with South African rugby to get money for the players. Now, obviously, this was a no-no for South African rugby because we were supposed to be amateurs. So much so that the uh, doctor liked them, came to see me and said they're going to chuck me out of the team and everything. And then I picked up this document and I said, what about this? Doc Craven signed this document. You guys are paying them X, Y, Z. So they said, where do you get that? We need that. I said, no, you're not going to get that. You're still going to pay us. So in this negotiation period, because Craven was on record saying he is going to declare me professional. And if you were declared professional those days, then you were chucked out of rugby. 
So it was interesting times, you know, from, from both sides, uh, I was maybe incorrect, but I stand to this day by that, that I bet, you know, Frank Chopin always tries to say, he was the first guy for the Springboks to stand for money and stuff like that, which is incorrect. The first time the Springboks were paid was in 1986. And it was the Thursday night before the fourth test at Ellis Park when Dr. Light and Young Peacock came in and they gave us our checks and I could pay the guys a dividend. In one of the chapters in the book, you talk about how your youngest brother, Paul, broke your heart, causing you and your family immense head. Can you tell us more about what happened and how you dealt with what went unsaid between you and Paul before his death? Yeah, look, it's a, it's, it's a sad situation. Um, you know, my mom and dad separated. They never got divorced. And uh, we were staying in a, what today will be called a hop house. You know, we were staying in the less privileged area, you know, of, of a homing, you know, a, a municipal housing scheme. My youngest brother was very talented. Paul was very talented. But uh, I think my mom, because she had to start working and she walked very far, you know, she walked about five and a half, six kilometers to work every morning. And she started work at seven. And, you know, I was delivering newspapers from five o'clock in the morning, you, you know, from the age of 13, 12, 13, and working every holiday. And Paul was just, you know, he was just this spoiled kid, you know. He didn't actually worry what was going on. And then later on in life, what happened was, and that's where I found out, if you haven't got the structure, stuff around you, things can go horribly wrong, you, you know. And post-school, he, he, I put him and paid for his first year at university, he only completed not even a quarter of it, and then just left. Mm. I tried to help him. I gave him a car. He just, he lost the car, you know, and so just exaggerated. And, uh, and then eventually, I think, uh, talented people get to a point where they realize they've lost the plot. You know, he, he cannot, he's not going to make it like he should have. You know, he's the first guy to be granted the right for Soviet genes in South Africa. He went and he stuffed that all up. I tried to help him. Eventually, I employed him on the farm, and uh, it was just a crazy period in our lives. You know, he tried to dominate everybody. He was a good looking, clever guy. And I think he, he then just felt. He's lost out, you know. My whole life, the only thing I knew every morning, uh, I had to wake up and I uh, to work, you know. Uh, I mean, this year has been more than 50 years that I've been looking after myself, you know. And some people don't understand it. But then he started doing funny things. And maybe it was, uh, my wife says it's, you know, eventually died of this brain tumor. Maybe the tumor also had a part of it, and, and he took very bad decisions. Anybody didn't agree with him, then they were like against him. And, uh, you know, most families get this. And, you know, he didn't even attend my mom's funeral, one of my brother or sister's weddings. He, he, he just became like a free agent to himself. Terrible time in your life, but I spoke about it. It's a hard part of the book to talk about. But, um, you know, being honest with myself, I had to talk about it. And briefly talk to us about the current state of coaching in South Africa, as you highlighted that you don't think there is highly intellectual coaches in modern rugby. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing, and we're seeing it now again. You know, we just can't do a weekend where we should have beaten the All Blacks. I mean, if ever we have had an opportunity to beat them, it was because they were bad. We've also been through a weekend where our three top teams, you know, I mean, the Sharks, the Bulls and the Stormers have lost overseas to not of the best teams. And the big thing is you've always got to redefine yourself and reinvent yourself. And what I base the whole debate on is um, in our days, I had a lot of respect for all the guys coaching. They were, they were intellectual guys. They were people at other jobs. That, you know, uh, they were leaders within the realm of people and stuff like that. And just remember... I believe the closest game to rugby is chess. They're both war games. You've got your pawns up front, they've got to do a certain job, and they're dispensable. And then behind them, you've got your bishop, your castle. Similarly in rugby, you, you've got your forwards and then you've got your backs. So you've got strategy, and you've got to work out strategy to beat the other team over a period of time. And how you use defense to, to be able to attack, or how do you use attack as a form of defense? And you can't just be one-dimensional because 
this environment that you're in is a very active environment. The people are planning and plotting to beat you. So you've got to work out these plans and you've got to be adaptable. You've got to be able, you can't say, like everybody's now saying, oh, we'll play that again. You lost. See, you, how, how these players can say, we'll do that again. I mean, you've got to work, work it out. There's a reason why you lost. Don't understand the reason. And people don't like change. The biggest inbuilt resistance anybody's got is to change. You drive to work every morning, and it's fine. And one morning, there's a, 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 there's a tree that's blown over, and, and you're disillusioned. You've just got to drive around the block. And that's how people are. If you don't understand that you've made a mistake, why change? But there's a reason. So in this debate also, everybody says you must play like Australians or New Zealanders. You've got to play like South Africans. Because the more I play like a New Zealander, the easier it is for a New Zealander to play against me, similarly in Australia or England. And we've got the best weather in the world. Because most of the places where our players play the winter doesn't rain. We are some rainfall areas. So we must be able to handle the ball and run and, and attack. Here we go against the New Zealanders. We have these two great opportunities to score tries in the last six minutes. And, and we just get rid of the ball. And nothing against Jack Ninam, but, but I mean, your whole life, if you've been telling everybody you're the world's best defensive coach, how are you going to coach attack? And this is where I'm starting to, to worry about it, because the, the intellectual side of rugby is much higher than most people think. And if you haven't got that in your mind, in your mindset, because once you get under pressure, what do you do? Your reaction is to what you normally do. So... You've got to foremost get people to think differently. And there's a wonderful uh, old adage that I always put on my kids' uh, wall. It says, the desire to win must always be greater than the fear of losing. So if your fear of losing is greater than your desire to win, you'll always be more defensive. And that's why rugby, there's an advantage for the attacker. There's always been an advantage for the attacker. They're trying to force it in to, yeah, if you kick and this and whatever, but that's my opinion. And, and I believe rugby is, is a total game. You know, it's one of the unique games in the world. Other than soccer, where everybody's similar size, in, in, our, in, in rugby, you can get a guy like me or can be a sumo wrestler playing with somebody like a fuff that can be an a, a Olympic gymnast. Because each position has got those unique physical attributes. So uh, I'm just passionate about the game and what it stands for. And lastly, tell us about your love for farming. When did it begin? Well, my love for farming began was probably, you know, us never owning a farm. Whatever. Me working on, uh, in, in holidays on the mate of mine's farm, you, you, you know, and, uh, and what I, I learned to prune and look after people picking grapes and stuff. And, and, and I've, I've got a bit of a, a love for the vine. So what happened was... Uh, I always thought it would be really nice if I could own a wine farm one day. And uh, so I worked very hard for my first bits of money. I bought my first wine farm. And then obviously I had to uh, invest in the cellar and stuff. And I think it's the same thing about rugby. It's the basics, you know, uh, the vines, you, 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 you know, the roots of the soil that they're in and how do you work around that. And uh, it was just a passionate thing. That was Kalk Beggar Senior speaking to Krima Media's Polity about just a moment.